Isaiah 47. The fall of Babylon. Isaiah 47, just one chapter tonight, the fall of Babylon. Our last study concluded with God's revelation of how we can be sure that he's the true and the living God, that the God we believe in is really God, creator of heavens and earth, sustainer of all things, the one true and living redeemer. So important. Isaiah 46, 9. You can look back if you want. It's right there. Um, Isaiah 46, 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God. There is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country, saying, oh, from a far, uh, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country, excuse me, I was grabbing something else, and uh, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes, yeah, I'm saying that a lot, right? He must, wait, wait, he must want you to hear that again or I wouldn't keep looking at it and would finally get past it. The man who executes my counsel from a far country, indeed, I've spoken it, I will bring it to pass. I've purposed it, I will also do it. What's God telling us? He knows the future. We can be sure because he reveals the future and he doesn't do it in vague generalities. He does it in specifics. He gives us names and dates and places and times and seasons. He tells us not just what's going to happen, but how it's going to happen and who will be involved when it does happen. And then even more than that, he knows, he reveals, and he controls the future. He concluded with an exhortation to listen, to look, to repent. Listen to me, Isaiah 46, 12. You stubborn hearted, who are far from righteousness, I bring my righteousness near. It shall not be far off. My salvation shall not linger and my place, and I will place salvation in Zion for Israel is my glory. Well, precious promises from the Lord. Isaiah 47 begins with God's condemnation on the Babylonians. Now, he'd chosen the Babylonians to discipline his rebellious, idolatrous, stiff-necked people of Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel had already gone into captivity at the hands of the Assyrians. He raises up the Babylonians to discipline his own children. But in doing so, they abused and humiliated and defiled them. They did everything they could to them. And God's promise to bless those who bless and curse those who curse isn't invalidated because we're on a mission from God. You see, Nebuchadnezzar somehow either didn't get that memo or lost touch with that reality. Somehow he lost touch with the fact that God sent him to deal for him, that he was representing, as we read last time, Cyrus would, and actually taking down the Babylonians as the Medo-Persians would come to rule and reign. So Babylon would receive full payment for their sins, at the hands of those God would raise up to judge them. Here's the main difference. When he judged his people, the purpose of the judgment was restoration, that they would cry out to God, that they would repent of their sin, that they would remember all the ways he cared for and blessed them. When he judges the Babylonians, it's more punitive, but even with them, there was always an opportunity for repentance. There was always 
that sense that God would rather have the wicked repent than repay in full what they had coming. Well, chapter 47 here tonight describes both the coming judgment and God's reasons for it. Take a look. Verse 1, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstone and grind meal. Remove your veil from Remove your veil, take off the skirt, uncover the thigh, pass through the rivers. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. Yes, your shame will be seen. I will take vengeance and I will not arbitrate with a man. It's a sobering reminder that God's patience with sinful man is not without limits. That all sin leads to suffering and death and and though he may stay judgment for a season, and we know why he does it, it's not as will any perish, but all come to repentance. Judgment will still come. I find it interesting that we're in this portion of Isaiah where we're looking at the fall of Babylon written at a time where Babylon hadn't even come to conquer yet. It's out there in the future, and yet it's described in such detail. Then he says, and you're going down after I'm done with you at the hands of the Medes and Persians. And in our study of Revelation, we're entering that section. This is the last chapter this week where it's dealing with some issues that haven't pushed the whole agenda forward. We took a four-chapter break. It's there in Revelation where he gives us information about what's happening and will be happening in the Middle East and why he's doing this and how this is going on and what's happening behind the scenes as Satan is pulling Antichrist strings and Antichrist is pulling the false prophet strings and all those things, it's leading us to, to, to Babylon, the rebuilt, not just city or nation, but a worldwide kingdom that he calls Babylon, well, we'll be looking at it for the next three or four weeks. Well, where are we, though, tonight? A sobering reminder that suffering, death are always the result of sin. Someone pays, and I'm blessed to see, as is so often the case, it just so happens. No, it doesn't just so happen. God put it here for this reason that we have a reference to our Lord and Savior as judgment is about to fall. As for our Redeemer, verse 4, the Lord of hosts is his name. I believe it's the New Living Translation that translate it, translates it, the, the, the Lord of Angels Armies. I like that. We sing it. But uh, I, it's, a, it's a good turn of a phrase. And that's who the hosts are, the, the angelic armies. The Holy One of Israel. Judgment on Babylon, as I mentioned, well, not last week, perhaps the week before, would mean redemption for Judah. Just as judgment on Egypt brought freedom and redemption to Israel. So our prayers, and we've camped on this in our study of Revelation, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, those will be answered through God's judgment of the wicked and the return of our Lord and Savior to rule and reign in righteousness. Sit in silence, he says, verse 5, and go into darkness. O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you will no longer be called the lady of the kingdoms. He goes on in verse 6 and 7 to remind us why God used them and why he judged them. I was angry with my people. I've profaned my inheritance and given them into your hand. That's why he used them. Now why he judged them. You showed them no mercy. On the elderly, you laid your yoke very heavily, and you said, I shall be a lady forever, so that you did not take these things to heart, nor remember the latter end of them. Verses 8 through 11 begin with, 
oh-so-common sins, the pursuit of pleasure, the pursuit of personal peace and prosperity, the resulting pride. And, and here's the saddest part. Our pleasure-seeking culture has a difficult time with the word sin. Why? It suggests that living to please myself instead of the one who made me or living to please myself instead of the family he gave me or the fellowship that he allows me to serve and minister to, that, that serving me, well, I get that that sin, putting me first, that's idolatry. Why? It's love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. You know where loving yourself actually comes in in that equation? It doesn't. It's just a lie that, you know, you can't love others till you love yourself. I think people who think that way, though they might not, they might have a British accent, but that's what I hear when they talk. Well, you know, can't love others unless you're loving yourself. No, the truth is you can't love others if this is your problem because you're too busy loving yourself. If we understand that, that God so loved us, he gave. Well, how could we demonstrate our love to him? Giving him what he asked for, our whole person everything, all we are, all we can be, and then demonstrating our love for others practically in ways that make a difference in their lives. Well, therefore, he says, verse 8, hear this now, you who are given to pleasures, who dwell securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there is no one else besides me. Let me ask you a question. What the Popeye Shirley MacLaine, um, Antichrist, and um, Satan have in common. Anybody know? They all say, I am. Yeah, Popeye, I am that I am, and it's all that I am. I'm Popeye the sailor man. I, I don't know that he meant anything by it, but it is some, the first time I ever heard it. And so Shirley MacLaine, I'm sure if you're younger, you don't know about her. And that's actually a good thing. I feel bad even using her name. Don't bother Googling her. So, but, but she wrote a book called, uh, what was it, Out on a Limb. I should have been called Out of My Mind or Out on a Tree, Out, out on, on, on My Tree or whatever. But in that book, she said, I am God. That's what these people are saying. I am. And not just that I am, there isn't any other. Listen, God says that over and over here. It's surprising to hear people say it. It's one thing when God says, I am, and there is no other. There was no God before me. There'll be no God formed after me. I am the only God, and I'm the only Savior. So Popeye, just a joke. Shirley MacLaine, well, sadly, the same. Um, <laughs> Satan, yeah, he says, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. It, it, he might as well say, I am, because what he's saying is, I'm going to have what belongs to God. And, and Antichrist, he does the same thing. He comes saying, I am, I'm the promised one. I'm the Prince of Peace. I'm the Redeemer. I'm your hope. I'm your help. None of that is true of any of them. Well, those given to sin and unwilling to repent find themselves living in denial. And the judgment's coming. But listen, verse 8, the latter part, I shall not sit as a widow nor shall I see the loss of children. This is both presumptuous and foolish because it leads to judgment. These two things shall come upon you in a moment, in a day, the loss of children and widowhood. They're specifically saying, at least my kids will be safe and I don't have to worry about my marriage. And God's saying, you're going to lose both those in a day. It reminded me, though, not just pagans, not just, you know, people that, that are oblivious to God. Even Peter had trouble believing the things Jesus told him. And he'd say crazy things like, that will never happen to you, Lord. That's after Jesus says, hey, this is going to happen, for it is written. 
So he's like, I'm telling you, and the word has it. That's two really good witnesses, Peter. I'd listen up. And, and by Peter, I mean any of you who are like Peter. And if you don't know if you're like Peter, give him the elbow, gals. And, uh, and we're, we're not going to see it, but, and I won't even watch him flinch. But I know there are some of you like that. God says, hey, here's how it is. Your wife says, hey, do you see this warning? And ah, come on, that ain't going to happen to us. We're, we're not going to lose. We're, we're winners. We're winning. No, in a moment, in a day, the loss of children, widowhood, they shall come upon you in their fullness. That's certainty, you see. Because of the multitude of your sorceries for the abundance of your enchantments. That's the what and the why of what's going down. For you've trusted in your wickedness. You said, no one sees me. Your wisdom, your knowledge have warped you. You've said in your heart, I am. There it is again. And there is no one else besides me. Therefore, evil shall come upon you. You shall not know from where it arises and trouble shall fall upon you. You will not be able to put it off. And desolation shall come upon you suddenly when you shall not know. Well, Samuel tells Saul, the king, Old Testament, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And because we're looking at these passages dealing with idolatry, and I'm sure most, if not all of you, would say, hey, I have never made a little idol and put it in my house and you might have bought one and put it in the car in the uh, garage though but uh yeah you could have bought it and put it in the car too but th th the point is this we don't make little idols because we're more sophisticated than that but that doesn't mean we don't have idols and if you're like I don't have anything that that, that I love more than Jesus because that is the essence of idolatry Loving me more or loving stuff more, loving my opinion over what God says, whoever and whatever we're, we're looking at, rebellion is as witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Now, I read that one on purpose again. The other, spaced in the grace. But, uh, but here's the thing. While you might not be into witchcraft, and I pray you're not, or into idolatry, if you've been rebellious or stubborn, ah, he's saying watch out because you need to know that while we don't see ourselves as idolaters, our sins are just as offensive to God as theirs were. Nebuchadnezzar, I don't know if you know much about him. He ruled the Babylonian Empire from 605 B.C. to 562 B.C. His name means, oh God, Nabu, protect my son. So when his dad names him, he says, let's name him, oh God, Nabu, protect my son. They shortened that to Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> but, but listen, an imaginary God can't save anyone from the judgment of the true and living God. And I, I, I'm saddened by how many people in our world are praying, but they're not praying to the true and living God. And they're thinking, but I'm so sincere, and, and, and certainly that counts for something. It doesn't. <laughs> Sincerity is only useful if, if you're right. You might really believe Canada is south of here. And you might think, if I go south, eventually I'll get there. And I guess it's possible, but you will have to go around the entire world to do it when you could just drive north and be there in a very short amount of time. Sincerity? So many people are sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, man, what a mess this guy was. He was the second worst boss ever. Now, I know some of you are younger and you don't have a boss yet. Some of you 
are working and you're out there for the first time, some of you have been there for years, if you have a really good boss, could you go tomorrow and say, I just want to tell you, you are a really good boss. Because, um, you know, and then when he looks at you like, okay, what do you want? Just say, no, I, I just wanted to tell you. It's awesome to work for someone with integrity and, and, and love and care and concern. If you have that kind of boss and you're not telling them what's wrong with you, it's so rare. And if you are a boss, be that kind of guy. I'm not a great boss. I'm really not. The biggest problem is I'm not good at bossing people. But I am a, a good guy to work for. You could ask anyone who works here. Of course, I don't ever tell them what to do, so they think, yeah. Maybe they don't know they work for me. But anyway, if you've ever had a bad boss, let me just say, he was the worst boss ever. But listen, those of you without a boss, did you ever have a bad teacher? Now, be careful down here. You guys are homeschooled. So not all of you, though. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't say. Yeah, they, they were good. So but, but listen. I had really good teachers and really bad teachers. I mean, not, I'm not saying bad. They just weren't good teachers. So good teachers and not so good teachers. And then I, I had bosses that were just a nightmare. I had bosses that tried to pay us with illegal substances for work we'd done. And it's not like we were doing illegal work. It was an actual job. And I'm like, my landlord won't take that. And, and I'm afraid to transport it. It's just crazy what people will do. And so, you know, I've lived for a long time. I lived in a lot of different environments, worked for a lot of different people. And I just want to say, serving God? So good. He is the ultimate. He always does the right thing. Listen, when it comes to bosses, Nebuchadnezzar was the second worst boss ever in history. He actually hired totally incompetent people, magicians. How many people, who hires magicians? I mean, I get it if it's an entertainment venue, but this is his staff. So he has magicians and astrologers and soothsayers and prognosticators. He has all these guys on staff. Then he has an issue, and he brings them in because this is what they were hired for. And they're like, oh, yeah, we could do that. <laughs> No problem, we got that. Oh, yeah, just anytime you have a dream, just tell us you had a dream. We'll tell you what the dream means. So one day he has a dream, and he comes to him, and he says, hey, I had a dream, and I want you to tell me what the dream was and, and tell me what it means. Most of you are familiar with the story, but listen, this is important because I have a sneaking suspicion that he had a sneaking suspicion that these guys on the payroll couldn't really perform. Oh, they could perform. They were actors. They pretended to know things they didn't. But since he couldn't know the difference, well, how would he know? I mentioned um, carbon dating on um, the weekend study, and someone in between churches, I should have used that third service. I just was, you know, I was getting wearing down. That happens now. But anyway, I mentioned carbon dating. He showed me this article, a scientific article on carbon dating. And some scientists say, oh, we don't even do that anymore. We're under radium or we got something new. But there are still people buying into it. But at the end of the article, it just says carbon dating works unless we already know the date of the object being dated. And I'm like, of course it works unless for the same reason that Nebuchadnezzar's astrologers and soothsayers could tell him what the dream meant unless he said, tell me what the dream was. It works because, well, if you don't know the date, how can you know that's not the date? But if you do know the date and they say, well, no, that's not the date, then we have a problem. And that's the problem he ran into. So, so let me get to it because it's just an illustration. I don't want to take up the whole study on it. But what happens is this guy was a bit impulsive, angry, frustrated. When he didn't get his way, he threw a tantrum. And because he had all power, he actually sent out the brute squad, a hit team. And, and, and he said, tell me the dream and tell me what it means. They acknowledged only the gods know that, and we don't really have any connection to them. 
So he decides, I'm going to kill them all. All the staff is going to die. And he started sending out a hit team to kill the entire group of prognosticators and astrologers and magicians and soothsayers and all the other guys who he hired to tell them things they didn't know. And then, well, Daniel saved, well, not all of them because he didn't get word till some of them were already gone. But he saved a good portion of them and himself and in the process found himself uh, promoted and God exalted. I'll read you that in a few moments. But, but or not time allowing, but, but here, here's the thing. I mentioned he was the second worst boss ever. You know the worst boss ever? The American taxpayer. We actually are the boss of the politicians we've put into those positions. We're a worse boss than Nebuchadnezzar because we've actually hired incompetent people who abuse us instead of us abusing them, who take advantage of us who give themselves raises that are unbelievable and benefits that we will never, ever, ever come close to. They work for us. And then they tell us, you can't fire us. You elected us. I'm like, why do we elect people we can't fire? Is it true we can't fire them? In any case, we're dumber than Nebuchadnezzar. That's all I got to say. And, and so uh, that's, that's what I got. So anyway, um, Daniel did tell Nebuchadnezzar his kingdom and authority and power were given to him by God. And he responded, promoting Daniel, exalting the true and living God. But all too soon, he stopped glorifying God and began instead to glory in his accomplishments. We're capable of that, giving God the glory for the blessings we have. And then over time, starting to sort of shift the emphasis to our faithfulness instead of his. And actually judge other people for their lack of having what we have when we didn't deserve it in the first place have it by God's grace. Now, I know some of you are real hard workers because I know you, and I don't want to take that away from you, but God gave you the ability to work hard. In the end, it should still be him being glorified. God, thank you for making me strong or making me smart or making me whatever he's made you. So here's the deal. Age abiding Lesson, age-abiding teaching, self-exaltation always leads to humiliation. have a couple pictures for you. Nebuchadnezzar's brilliant city. It included vast fortifications, famous streets such as the processional, the canals, the temples, the palaces, the Ishtar Gate led through the double wall of the fortifications adorned with rows of bulls and dragons and colored enamel brick. Nebuchadnezzar's throne room was likewise adorned with enameled bricks. The tall ziggurat was rebuilt. Herodotus said that it rose to a height of eight stages. Nearby the temple of Murdoch or Bel was restored by the king. Not far distant were the hanging gardens, which to the Greeks were one of the seven wonders of the world. One day, Nebuchadnezzar, was walking the walls of that city. And in Daniel 4, we have it. It's just one chapter. That's why I can get away with this today. In Daniel 4.30, listen, is this not Babylon the Great? Yes, it is. The same one that Daniel told you God gave you and gave you authority and gave you power and gave you this amazing palace and place to live. Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? Watch out. This guy is in trouble. It reminds me of a story of a kid who came home from school. It's been a really good day, and he comes home and says, Mom, how many truly great men do you think there are in the world? And she wisely answered, One less than you think, son. So anyway, Neb had forgotten his blessings came from God and had become instead this 
this worshiper of himself, this idolizer of his potential and his power and, and his glory. And we're in danger of the same things happening. It's crazier when it happens to us because we've accomplished so little compared to him. But people still do it. Look at what I've built. Look at what I've accomplished. Look at me. And God's like, I'm looking. I don't know. I don't know. Well, while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you, listen, until you know that the most high rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. That word until is a huge word of grace. He says, you are going to live like a dumb animal. You're going to just be outside and you're going to grow, you know, hair like feathers and your fingernails are going to look like Howard Hughes at the end and, and you're just going to be a mess. And so that, that word until, it reminds us that God's judgment was then and is now and most often restorative, not merely punitive. The next words in verse 33, and I'm still reading from Daniel 4, but we don't have much more in this. It's a short chapter, like I said. They remind us that that very hour, that very hour, it reminds us that judgment tarries, but it always comes. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men. He ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. This is important. It's all important. God didn't make him when he, you know, judged him a carnivorous, ravenous beast. Why? That's what he was before. When he looked like and acted like a man, he was deadly dangerous. He was hostile and all-powerful and aggressive. And he was a terror to people who served him and even worse to those who didn't. So God just says, nah, you know, we'll make you passive. You'll be like a cow or an ox. You'll just eat grass, you know, the whole vegetarian thing. And, uh, you know, somebody told me, now I'm not even going there because I really like you vegans and vegans and whatever else you are, <laughs> not you vagrants, but the rest of you. Um, no, I, I even like the vagrants. But, um, well, no one else could help. No one else could heal. He, he was absolutely helpless himself. Only God could bring him back. And could I suggest tonight that sometimes we're trying to fix things we just don't have the tools to fix. We try to fix each other. And what we need to do is just pray for each other and, and petition the Lord, please help my friend, please help my son, please help my husband or my wife or my brother or my sister or whoever it might be. Lord, you know them, you made them, you love them. You have the keys to their heart. We don't have any of that. We're not the healer. We're not the Messiah. We're not a savior. We're just someone who knows the one who can do all those things. When those friends brought the, the, para, the paraplegic man and let him down through the roof, they brought him to Jesus because they knew no one else could help him and they truly believed Jesus would heal him. And he gave them more than they, they bargained for. He not only healed him, he forgave them. So important, whatever we think we can do, we got to petition our Lord and say, Lord, show me my part, and I want to be faithful in it. But I'm going to trust you to do the real work, and I'm going to give you the glory for all good outcomes. I'll take responsibility for the bad, Lord, but I give you the glory for the good. Babylon, for a season, it was without a king. I wonder how they felt. Seeing the king, is that the king out there eating grass on his fours, in all fours? What did the captives think? What did his captains think? 
What did his wife and son think? At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven. Among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles restored to me. I was restored to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are true and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Can I suggest there's only two ways to learn that lesson? That those who walk in pride, he's able to put down. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Because if you're thinking at all, and I'm sure some, if not most of you are, some of you are beyond that, you're just going to wake refreshed. But most of you thinking, <laughs> tracking. And, and here's the thing, if, if you get it, if you're hearing it, you're going to be humbled either way. So humble yourself, he'll exalt. You exalt yourself, he will humble you, and that will prove to be painful. Well, God judged him, then restored him, leading Nebuchadnezzar to praise not himself but God and to acknowledge all God does is true and just and that pride is the road to judgment. Stand now, back here in, not you stand now, we'll do that in a moment when we worship. Stand now because it's the short chapter and I just chose to do one. It's kind of relaxing to me. I don't know how it feels to you. It's, it's daunting to do two or three chapters every Wednesday. I'll have you do it sometime if you think not. Stand now with your enchantments and the multitude of your sorceries in which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you will prevail. Now, it might just be me, but doesn't that sound a bit like sanctified sarcasm? Perhaps? Yeah, perhaps. I like it because... I believe sarcasm is a gift. <laughs> Pam has pointed out, and I've shared with you, it's not a spiritual gift, but it is a gift. <laughs> and so God's just saying, stand, show your stuff, do your thing. You're wearied in the multitude of your counselors. Let the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you for what shall come upon you. Today, because we don't use words like prognosticator and, well, stargazer, maybe. But today, it'd be like, you're struggling. You're going through a hard time. Check your horoscope. Get a fortune cookie. Um, hey, Madam Ruby, palm reader, tarot cards, tea leaves, all of those, worthless. But it's like he's saying, hey, that's what you're trusting in? That's what you're relying upon? Behold, they shall be as stubble, verse 14. Fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. It shall not be a coal to be warmed by, nor a fire to sit before. Listen, God promises to judge all who traffic in deception who, as Isaiah tells us, here and elsewhere, substitute lies for truth, darkness for light. Listen, important to know, Satan's goals have never changed. He wants to be worshipped, and to that end, he presents himself as an angel of light. He tries to convince people he's something and someone he's not. He's always been about deception. God says, I made you. He says, evolution. No, but that's our scientist. 
Well, if it's not coming from God, it's coming from the enemy because believe it or not, there are no original thinkers. Everybody is listening to some voice and if it's not the voice of God, it's the voice of the enemy of our souls. And you know it's not just in all of that. Some would say, well, evolution, that's crazy. Everyone knows aliens planted us here. And, you know, because, hey, it's almost more logical. We were planted by someone not from here, you realize. We were made and created by God who ain't from around here. He made all these things, but Satan wants to divide. Satan wants to destroy. Satan's about death. God's about bringing us unity and, and, and blessing us and using us and transforming us and giving us life and hope and patience and peace. I hear, you know, and, and I, I get that it's probably partially true at least, that, that it's harder today, that this is a tougher generation to live in than prior generations. And I wouldn't say that's not true. Now, we thought that in our generation, once we got out of the craziness of which you know, we were engaged, we were like, man, this is a hard generation to, to see the truth and to see the light. And, and, and I do know today because of technology, there's just a lot of things going on that have never been going on, not to the degree they are today, and not with the clarity, if that's a word you could use for it. But, but here's what I know. Satan has always used technology, and he just he never changes his, his MO, his, his plan, his strategy, just alters with the technology. He uses available technology. And so when... When all there was was a radio, he wanted to distract people with radio. When all there was was television, then it was that. And, and then it was, you know, the, the Internet. And then it's, well, you, you know. The, the point is, well, technology, last days, revelation, we're looking at it. It's increasing dramatically. It's going to be used for good by God and by, for evil by the enemy of our souls. Thus, shall they be to you, verse 15, with whom you have labored. Your merchants from your youth, they shall wander each to his quarter. No one shall save you. Interesting, he uses the word merchants as we look at Babylon and Revelation. And Babylon's mentioned 287 times in Scripture, only 12 in the New Testament. Half of those are in Revelation. All of those are in chapters 14, which we'll be looking at this week. Through 18. So Babylon of the last days, it's a much more sophisticated uh, city technologically, and it's a world ruling empire. But, but here's, here's what he's saying to them back in that day and, and to well, those who will be around in the, the future, there's only one savior. And, and Babylon will rise again, but only to face a final judgment. And, and so they'll wander from their quarter, but no one, he says, will save them. Lord, we thank you that you have spoken to us, that you called us out of darkness into your glorious light. And Lord, I pray you would, first of all, remind us, as you reminded me today, that was your plan and your work that all I did was turn to you when you called my name. And you, Lord, having already chosen me, already provided for my salvation, you told me you loved me and wanted a relationship with me. And in that moment, Lord, I saw you and wanted you too. And my prayer, our prayer tonight, is that that would be our reality each and every day that we wouldn't look around at what we've done or boast in what we're going to do. We're grateful for the gifts you've given us, for the opportunities that you put before us, for the fruit that comes when we're just faithful to plant the seed of truth, and for the joy that comes when we walk in the truth and in the light and in love. 
And Lord, we pray that that would be reality for every person you've drawn here tonight. If you've wandered from the Lord, come home to him tonight. If you've never given your life to the Lord, do that tonight. If you're not yet born again of his spirit, he died for your sins, was buried, rose again. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Forgive my every sin. Or, Lord, I'm coming back to you, turning it all back to you, giving you myself afresh. If that's you, but especially if you've never given your life, please raise your hand and let me pray with you not because you have to pray with me to be saved. You just have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive him as your Lord and Savior, and you will be saved. Saved from eternal devastation, destruction, division, divided from family and friends, separated from the Lord. But he gave so you could live. He gave his life so you could live. He died for your sins, was buried and rose again. And he went tonight ready to say, yeah, Jesus, come into my life. Save me from myself. Save me from my sins. Lord, you know us perfectly. Deal now. Continue to have your way in and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.